Thanks, Brother James. We now look forward to Brother Nathan's final study to the theme, The Fellowship of His Sufferings. Thanks, Brother Nathan. Well, thanks, Brother Grant, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we have come to the end of our foray into the book of Lamentations, and hopefully it has enlarged your understanding and maybe even your enjoyment of the book. But now that we've finished the book itself, I thought we might slow down a little bit this morning because I know we've been moving at a bit of pace, and just try and uh, spend um, a few minutes this morning just considering the subject of suffering itself as the main theme that emerges from Lamentations, finding meaning, looking for meaning in the misery. And you remember that we left Lamentations yesterday with this thought or question in our minds. If Lamentations chapter 3 is going to be the picture of Christ in the middle of two thieves, the man who has seen affliction despite his innocence but who would offer meaning and hope, then we have a choice before us. Do we want to be part of an unrepentant community that's afflicted because of sinfulness, but we end up just going through life enduring grief without meaning? That's the afflicted daughter of Zion. Or are we determined to be affected by this man in the middle and be the repentant thief, the faithful community inspired by this man's example and his perspective to rely on God and to patiently wait for him, to join ourselves to the precious sons of Zion. Because the nation before Lamentations 3 and after are totally different in their perspectives and the choice is ours. When it comes to suffering, do we want to be bitter or better? Do we want to be resentful or renewed? Do we want to wallow in in unenlightened self-pity, as the people of Lamentations 1 and 2 did? Or do we identify with this man who has seen affliction? Do we recognize in him our fellow, our representative, our example? Are we willing to let him drastically alter our thinking? Are we ready to side with him and share his hope and unshakable faith? Are we ready to investigate what it means to fellowship his sufferings? I mean, if if, uh, Isaiah 53, in the first instance, has the suffering servant as Hezekiah, and he was able to inspire the nation in the times of Sennacherib's invasion. And if in Lamentations 3, in the first instance, the man who has seen affliction was actually Jeremiah, and he was able to turn the nation from self-absorbed disbelief to repentance and contrition, then how much more can Messiah change and touch us? Heal us. And I'd like to start our story this morning in Mark chapter 5. This is a story that we we mentioned um, in an earlier class, but I want to just look at briefly this morning because it's relevant to the healing that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 5 and verse 24. And Jesus went with him, that is with Jairus, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. This woman is a graphic picture, a type of ourselves, all of us, without Christ, without his healing. This is where we all start suffering. 
suffering many things. And it's not just from the incurable bruise of sin, but it's from our own attempts to cure ourselves. We want to turn to anything, anyone other than the true source of life. No other physician can heal the hurt of our souls, and she is broken and lost, and worse, she is deteriorating. She instinctively knew that all she needed to do was to touch him, to align herself with him, to identify with him. And by his stripes, by his experience of suffering himself, she knew that she could be healed. Now we know the story, but Mark chapter 5 records for us a couple of things that Luke chapter 8 does not. It tells us that she touches the border of blue of his garment, and verse 30 tells us that virtue, literally it should be power, had gone out of him. She felt the healing come into her body, verse 29, and he felt the virtue leave his body, verse 30. Both of them were affected. They were both affected by the same interchange of power. Linked in fellowship by the removal of the plague of suffering, verse 34. She was made whole again. And this is a type of us, our lives. This is a type of our healing. And our healing is with him. Virtue goes out of his body and into her body. It's by him. It's with him. It's through him. He bears our iniquities. Isaiah 53 and verse 11. We are joined to him in the experience of suffering and the bearing of it away. We have it in common. And it's not just suffering, is it? It's suffering for a higher purpose. Suffering with a goal in view. Suffering for an ultimate goal. We are inseparably linked to him by this experience. And did you note that after 12 years of slowly growing worse, there could be no mistake. When she came in contact with Jesus Christ, immediately healed slowly deteriorating for 12 years, immediately healed, there could be no mistake, this man can totally and drastically change our lives. Now we know that we are linked to Christ in suffering because of how the scriptures talk about the necessity for Christ and ourselves to suffer. Look at these references, we know them pretty well, but you might like to take a note of them somewhere. It's about how Christ had to suffer, the inevitability of his suffering. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Luke 24, verse 26. In verse 46, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer. It was appropriate, it was right that even a sinless man had to go through suffering. But those things which God had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer. Acts chapter 3, verse 18. Acts chapter 17, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. In Acts 26, verse 22 to 23, I continue unto this day witnessing that Christ should suffer and be the first that should rise. It was prophesied by all the prophets. It was inevitable. And the same is true of us. We are linked to him. We fellowship him in the fact that we are all suffering for a greater good and that that's God's will. Just as he suffered for a greater good, just as it behoved Christ to suffer, it behoves us to suffer. Acts 14, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Philippians 1, 
for unto you it is given not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. First to Thessalonians 3, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Second Timothy 3, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And first to Peter 4, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's appropriate, it's right that you suffer because in this way you are inseparably linked to the man who can bear that suffering away. We fellowship our Lord Jesus Christ and his suffering. Would God exempt us from what It was necessary that even Christ experienced. Suffering is our Father's way of touching, teaching our heart rather than just our head. Suffering encourages intimate moments and experiences. We know this to be true, brothers and sisters. When we feel alone and desperate and lost, and abandoned and in despair, we turn to God in a very real and authentic way. It doesn't just happen by books, does it? It doesn't just happen by reading the scriptures. It happens by the experiences of life that our hearts are turned to God. There's no energy for superficiality or pretense when times of suffering and difficulty come upon us. We're brought down to the essence of who we are and what is important. And we turn to what's important in those difficult moments. Do you know, our brother Grant mentioned in his prayer a couple of Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. You'll remember what the Beatitudes sound like, but listen to how general they are until a point. Matthew chapter 5 says this. You don't have to turn it up, just listen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. The peacemakers, for they shall inherit. It be called the children of God. But when it comes to persecution... When it comes to suffering, blessed are you when men will revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. There's something about suffering that makes the truth intensely personal. It takes it from a generalization down to our lives in that moment It brings us to know God. We learn things that we could not learn in any other way. Joseph in jail. Daniel in a lion's den. Jeremiah in a pit. Paul in a shipwreck. We have something in common with Christ. Something that we fellowship with him. A heavenly father who is interested enough to shape our lives by suffering. Should we be surprised to find that trials and pressure are inevitable? Look what Peter says. Why do you think it a strange thing that these things are happening to us? It's God's way of linking us to Christ. It's God's way of yoking us to him. And when Paul was stopped in his tracks on the road to Damascus by that, by that blinding light, which was able to blind his eyes even through his tightly squeezed eyelids. Our Lord Jesus Christ told him, you will be Christ to the Gentiles. And the way in which you will be inseparably linked to me is that I will show you how great things you must suffer for my sake. Acts chapter 9 and verse 16 This is what links us, gives us fellowship with Christ, the experience of suffering. It's not the only thing, but it's it's one of those things. So why is the fellowship of suffering such 
an important part of discipleship? Well, because we know that difficulties and suffering and trouble and calamity builds character. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect. Or first of Peter, that the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, may, might be found unto praise and honor. If we are exercised by chastening, then it builds and gives us peaceable fruit. If we uh, have our minds energized and worked by our temptations, we are made perfect. If we discover to find what is behind our trials, we realize praise and honor. Suffering is all about character. It's all about character. Suffering is not just about losing things and suffering loss. It's not about exact retribution. It's not about having things taken away. I mean, you look at the experience of Job, who James puts forward as the great patient man of the Old Testament who suffered enormous things. From Job chapter 1 to chapter 42, he had everything taken away. His wealth, his family, his security, his sense of purpose. But the lesson was really all about whether Job and his three friends could still see that God was in control. And when they learned that, God gave everything back. Everything back to Job, because it was not about the things which he took away. It was not really about the deprivation. It wasn't really about the suffering. It was really to build character. And when he received the character of Job, greatly improved through that experience, all those things came back to Job, because it was all about character. So we ask the question, suffering in our lives, are our calamities building character or are we actually just suffering without thinking about meaning are we suffering the same things over and over again and not learning is that why suffering is continuing because we're just not getting it because we're not attempting to understand how our characters might be changed are we progressing in our understanding through suffering and what I'd like to propose for most of this morning is that actually within the construct of suffering, there is a definite progression. There is a process of development that enables us in suffering to be more like Christ, that we might fellowship his suffering. And I've called it the hierarchy of suffering. You might have a much better word than that. But it's the, reason, the reasons why we are prepared to suffer. And those reasons, I think you'll see, can be quite different, quite different from each other. And we want to see this morning a progression in our understanding of why we might suffer and fellowship the sufferings of Christ. We're going to start down the bottom with the first step on the hierarchy, suffering without meaning. This is where the, really the majority of the world, 99% of the world is in category number one. Suffering without meaning. Bad things happen. People get cancer. People die early. People lose money. People break up. Terrible things happen. Terrible suffering. People die in war. Atrocities. All of this is happening without any ability to find meaning, as we have said, because meaning only comes from God. The rest of the world is stuck here, largely in this bottom section. Suffering without meaning. Suffering is endured as a universal experience, irrespective of sin or merit. And come to Luke chapter 13, because 
Here's an example of that. We're going to look up one example for each of these. Luke chapter 13 and verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's a nice sort of euphemistic way to saying they were slaughtered. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered these things? Suffering happens as a universal experience, irrespective of sin or merit. We just read Mark chapter 5 and verse 26. The woman with the issue of blood suffered many things and actually was slowly growing worse. This is the experience of our lives, really without Christ, suffering without meaning. But then we come to a point where we we are able to endure some suffering and we're prepared to suffer some things because we accept that this can build character. There's suffering with acceptance. And you might even argue that some people in the world are prepared to go through suffering because they feel that there will be some intrinsic good, even without God in their lives that this this will build character and make us a better person. Obviously, in Christ, we understand it to mean that we will build a spiritual character in our lives. So come to 1 Peter in chapter 4 and see how this is no longer suffering without meaning. This is suffering with acceptance that it might bring forth good in our lives. It might build character. Verse 19 of 1 Peter 4 Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, it doesn't say as unto a faithful heavenly father. It says unto a faithful creator. Because when we suffer, God is creating something in us. And that thing is character the character of Jesus Christ. And so we are prepared to suffer some things because we accept that it will build our character. First of Timothy 4 says, we suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. We acknowledge that there will be some good things that come out of our suffering. But then we come to a point where we are prepared to go even further. We're prepared to suffer more things because we identify with Jesus Christ. This is suffering with identification. We're prepared to suffer more things because it's for his sake. So Philippians chapter 1, and look what it says in verse 29 of Philippians chapter 1. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. To suffer because of him, for his name. Acts chapter 5 and verse 41 says, they counted it in honor, a thing of worth, to suffer shame for his sake. And for his name. So we're prepared to suffer more things because we identify with Christ. We're no longer suffering just abstractly because it might be good for us. We're doing it because we're doing it with him, for him, for his sake, because we identify with Jesus Christ. And then I think we progress from this to suffering with love. We're prepared to suffer most things because we can see that it might lead to the salvation of others. Rather than just having an inward focus where suffering might give us good or because we identify with Christ, now we're prepared to suffer most things because we can see that it might help other people. We're motivated for something outside of ourselves. 
for the salvation of others. Come across to 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 and verse 6. Perhaps we read from verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. We're prepared to suffer, verse 6, because we can see that it might be helping somebody else. We do this out of love for our brothers and sisters. Second of Timothy 2, in verses 9 and 10, says that we endure all things for the elect's sake. We're prepared to put up with immense suffering for each other. Well, that's a, another level, isn't it, of our willingness to engage in the sufferings of Christ. And we do this because this is Christ's example. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Here's a man who was prepared to suffer so that he could sanctify his brethren. He's suffering out of love. He's suffering because it might help and save others. This is the next stage in our understanding and progression of why we suffer. So we're prepared to suffer some things. We're prepared to suffer more things. We're prepared to suffer most things. What about suffering with faith? I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but here's where it gets tough for me. Suffering wrong things. Because this is Christ's example. We appreciate that this is the ultimate example of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of prepared to undergo some degree of suffering because I can see greater good. I'm prepared to do that for Christ. I'm prepared to even do some of those things for you. But man, when I have to suffer something wrong for Christ's sake, that's where it gets really tough for me. When Suze comes and says, we need to talk. And that talking really means you need to listen. And that listening really means here's how you're wrong. And I don't agree and I don't think it's fair. It is extremely difficult to remain silent and to not justify myself. Suffering wrong for Christ's sake is enormously difficult. And here's our next level. Are we prepared to suffer wrong because we appreciate that this is the ultimate example of Christ? 1 Corinthians 6 says, are you prepared to suffer yourself to be defrauded? Come to 1 Peter in chapter 2 because we should really read these words because these words are well known to us but bring home this message better than I could. 1st of Peter, chapter 2, and verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, for your faults ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well... And suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. This is a higher level, isn't it? This is a harder thing to do. Chapter 3 
and verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. People accuse us of doing or saying something wrong, and we haven't actually done that. We are suffering for well-doing. It's all very well to suffer because of our sins. That's kind of like step number one. That's what everybody does. We all sin. We all experience suffering. It's a universal uh, law of consequences that came in in Genesis chapter 3. But suffering wrongfully? Willingly? For Christ's sake? Oh, this is a lot harder. This is a much harder call, isn't it? That we've been called to. Well, how about then the next step? We are prepared to suffer the loss of all things that we might win Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and our reading tonight, we know these words so well. We know the, the qualifications of Paul, his experience. How many years... Did he put into university, brothers and sisters? How many hours did he put in late at night studying the scrolls? How many deprivations did Paul put up with to sit at the feet of Gamaliel? And he's going to tell us, I'm prepared to suffer the loss of all things because that's what Christ did. This is not just suffering wrongfully, this is suffering the loss of of all things that we might win Christ. This is suffering with hope. We believe that we will be like him if we emulate him. And lastly, we come to the last step. We rejoice to suffer anything that might allow us to fill up our fellowship with the sufferings of Christ This is now suffering with joy. Suffering with joy. The fellowship of his suffering. Come across, if you're in Philippians, just one page to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the ecclesia, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And the Apostle Paul knew what it was like to rejoice in suffering anything that might bring him closer to the sufferings of Christ. That's what he did, didn't he, in Acts chapter 16, with Silas by his side, his feet in the stocks, beaten, nothing to be thankful for in this life, and they sang praises of joy that rang through the prison. Here's here's the objective of suffering, to get to this point where we're prepared to to suffer anything that might allow us to associate and fill up that which is behind of the sufferings of Christ. 1st of Peter 3 and verse 14 says, If ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. That's a difficult place to get to, isn't it, brothers and sisters? A very difficult place to get to. But Paul got there, and presumably Silas got there, And presumably some of the other apostles got there. And I would dare to say that there's people who gave their lives in the Inquisition faithfully for Christ who got there. And I would dare to say there's probably older brothers and sisters in our knowledge and experience, maybe even sitting here, who have got to that point. It's not going to happen probably when we're 17 years old, is it? But this is the journey of a lifetime up this hierarchy of suffering. Now, this hierarchy is not perfect. You might want to change it 
You might want to adapt it. You might be sitting there and thinking, I'd like to see uh, one, two, and three, and then I'd like to see faith, hope, and love all kind of on the same level, and then finally joy at the top. That's okay. It's really the idea, the idea that we are growing upwards. It's the spiritual framework that's important. It's not a strict schedule where we graduate to the next level, but it's a gradual progression, a gradual improvement of thought, of motivation in our lives, a gentle transformation upward as we grow spiritually, as our characters are molded to be more receptive to his gentle hand. We mature. Maybe we endure suffering for different reasons. As we mature, we make progress upwards through this hierarchy. Maybe we're at different places for different things in our lives. But the most important thing is that we are climbing towards him. We are climbing towards the top. We go from a miserable and reluctant acceptance that maybe there might be some character development possible in trial to a joyous freedom that enables us to suffer whatever our Heavenly Father in His wisdom thinks is necessary that we can fellowship, share in the experiences of Christ and be like Him, the man intimately acquainted with suffering. You think what a privilege it is, brothers and sisters, that we've been called to be like Him. To be like Him. How are we going to go from being like ourselves and I won't describe myself because you know all too well what I'm like, to that. How are we going to go from here to there? There's only one way, by pressure, by suffering, by conforming us to his image. So again, this is not a perfect diagram, but hopefully it's a helpful one as we sort of try and appreciate our journey and look where it ends. What an end point for suffering. Who would have put joy as the end point for suffering. That's what James chapter 1 and verse 2 says. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. It's an incredible point to get to in our lives. And as we've said, absolutely impossible without God. But this is where our Lord got to. Remember these words? For the joy of set before him and when we are able to endure suffering or we might say chastening which would probably be a better word and when we're able to endure it for more and more mature reasons this is what Paul calls sharing the fellowship of his suffering it's suffering for the right reasons it's suffering for his reasons with him The aim is getting to joy in suffering. Do you know, this is what Moses said way, way back in Psalm 90, verse 15. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Make us glad. There's the incredible perspective of a man who understood this word and You know, we say Jeremiah suffered, and he did, and many of the prophets suffered. But can you imagine leading two two million miserable, whinging Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years? I mean, this man suffered enormous things as well. And he said, make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us. What an incredible perspective. We're aiming for joy in our sufferings. So how can we reach joy? Well, as we conclude our study of lamentations and the meaning of suffering, it's really for three reasons. And the first one is that suffering is for our ultimate good. Now, we all know that suffering doesn't feel good. Suffering never feels good. But feelings are not facts. And the facts are 
that actually suffering is for our good. Look what Joseph says in Genesis 50. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You couldn't almost get a better description of the atonement in the book of Genesis than that little phrase. This whole thing is meant for our good, to save us alive. And everything that looked evil was actually for our good. Or Deuteronomy 8, who fed thee with manna in the wilderness that he might humble thee and prove thee and do thee good in thy latter end. Psalm 119, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Or Romans 8, we know that all things work together for good for those that love God. And the greatest example of this has to be the crucifixion, does it not? I mean, when we look at the crucifixion, it's so wrong and so evil that that happened to a perfect, lovely man. But out of the greatest evil and the cruelest suffering came the greatest good. Suffering is for our good. There is more cause for joy in our suffering beyond just goodness, though. And that's because suffering ultimately will bring us to perfection. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And it's not just Christ, it's ourselves, says Peter, but the God of all grace who has called us unto his heavenly glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. This is our hope. Suffering is not just to ultimately realize good, but to ultimately realize perfection. In Christ and in us. And yet I think you would agree that even this has a tinge of selfishness. It's our good. It could be we, us, seeking after our perfection. But the ultimate purpose of suffering is for our changed lives to be a testimony to something not of ourselves but of God. And the clue as to what that is is right here in these two quotations on suffering perfecting us. Because the ultimate good is really hidden in those two verses. It's the glory of suffering. Suffering is to bring us to a point where we reflect God's glory and his character as we saw last night with our brother Ben. Actually, the true end point of suffering is the declaration of God's glory in us. This is the purpose in our lives. I'd like you to come back to Luke chapter 15 because as we close this morning with just a couple of references I'd like to draw your attention to the story of the prodigal son. Because epitomized in the story of the prodigal son is the lesson of suffering, the change. The change from Lamentations 1 and 2 to Lamentations 4 and 5. Now we know, we know the story, but embedded in this story is a key for our lives. And it's the proof that suffering makes a difference. Suffering makes a difference. Luke chapter 15 and verse 12. Reading from verse 11, he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said unto his father, father, you might want to put a circle around these words, give me, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And he went out and he spent everything. 
rapidly and foolishly on himself. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he, he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have eaten his, eaten his fill with the, with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And you might like to put a circle around those words. Make me. This is the story of the prodigal son. The purpose of suffering is to make us come to ourselves to realize the wonderful character of our Father and to throw ourselves on his mercy. And we go from give me to make me. And suffering is the difference. It takes us from focusing on ourself to focusing on God. And we see in our prayers that our prayers go from Comfort me to conform me. It's no longer give me, it's make me. This is spiritual maturity. This is the difference between Lamentations 1 and Lamentations 5. God's glory can be seen, brothers and sisters, in transformed lives. It's not just seen in people who suffer but in people who suffer with the right attitude for the right reasons, people who understand the purpose of suffering and the ultimate end, immortality. And more more than just that, a fellowship with Christ, a family likeness with him. We're all God's children. He and us conformed to his image. Come, if you will, to Romans chapter 8 in conclusion of our studies together this week. These well-known words, verse 17, or reading from verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then ears, ears of God and joint ears with Christ. Why are we joint ears with him? Because we have been joined together in fellowship with him by our sufferings. Joint ears with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is all about developing a family likeness. We are children. We are sons. We are joint heirs. But only if we suffer with him. Our sufferings are not worthy to be compared with what God has promised to give Christ. And if we are prepared to fellowship his sufferings and fill up the sufferings of his body behind, then we are in him and we will inherit all things. And our brother Harry Tennant said, the best is yet to come. It's all going to be worth it, brothers and sisters. It is all going to be worth it. Some of you may have had the experience of watching your wife give birth And all of the pain disappears in just minutes. And I asked her after the last time, 10 minutes after she gave birth, where 10 minutes earlier she was saying something quite different, would you do it again? And she said, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. All the pain and the suffering 
dissolves in a moment of time with the joy of that child. This is what it's going to be like, brothers and sisters. Which of us, having experienced only 10 minutes of immortality, 10 minutes of immortality will not say, I'd do it all again. In fact, I'd put up with a lot more to be here right now. 10 minutes into eternal life. This is our hope, brothers and sisters. This is our goal. This book can be our inspiration. Let's pray that his glory might be seen in all of us, revealed in us, perfected by suffering, and that the timeless message of lamentations for us might not have been in vain.